Hey guys, thank you so much for joining me in another video. So as you can tell based on the title, today we are gonna talk about the brand, the woman and the brand, Jill Sander, and how her brand has evolved. It's been a brand that has gone through a lot of ups and a lot of downs, a lot of tumultuous times on the business side. A lot of major changes have happened. And just for my bag of the day, I had this bag, I think since like 2018, and it's just been such a good, long-standing, it's just such a good bag. Anyways, and just for my outfit, I'm wearing this Caperni blazer. It's kind of interesting. These Margella jeans. These are jeans that when I bought them, I was like, I'm not cool enough to wear them and I did not wear them. Now I'm just wearing them because I don't really care. So yes, let's get into the video and let's just talk about the history. So Heidi Marie Jeline Sander, also known as Jill Sander, was born November 27th, 1943 in Weisselburn, Germany. She studied at the Crayfield School of Textiles and also was a foreign exchange student at the University of California in Los Angeles. And after UCLA, she actually moved moved to New York as a magazine fashion writer to work at McCall's. And then at the age of 21, her father unexpectedly passed away. So she moved back to Germany and then started writing for German publications, Constance and Petra. And with her early fashion beginnings, she actually opened up a boutique in 1967 in Hamburg. And it was selling a mixture of different brands, including Mugler, Sonia Raquel, as well as her own brand. And at this early stage, very interestingly, she started designing clothing for a chemical company. I'm just gonna include the name on the screen here. So she was designing clothing for this company using man-made materials, so very like technical fabric materials that were flame retardant, very interesting, extreme practicality and functionality early on in her fashion career. And then in 1973, she actually launched a collection under her own brand name and showed in Paris in 1975. But the collection honestly was not really well received at the time. When we just think of the 70s, even into the 80s. It's just ultimately her minimal aesthetics did not blend with the more maximal design to the late 70s and early 80s. Despite this, she was still doing her own thing, a heavy use of neutral color palettes, very high-end fabrics. In school, she did study textiles. She really focused on very clean, practical, sensible tailoring. Often I find when I read these articles, there's always this connection made to the Bauhaus movement that occurred in the 19th. 1920s. So if you're not familiar, this was this school that operated from 1919 to 1933 that combined crafts and fine arts, but it integrated design and it was trying to unify this vision of the arts and design in a way that could be mass produced. And there was this high emphasis on function. The principles of the Bauhaus school are definitely something you can see being applied to her approach to fashion. And what's very interesting is, yes, I think a lot of people People will refer to her as minimalist. When you look at her fashion, it is very minimalist aesthetically. She was also interested in design purity. I'm gonna read this article from the New York Times and the article is called The Modernist. Sander is a formalist concerned primarily with structure and shape and where other designers talk in terms of inspirations and of narratives bored from the last movie they caught at Film Forum, Sander prefers to limit conversation about her work to philosophical abstractions rarely associated with those in the garment trade. The pursuit of lightness has always been one of her main concerns. She is referring to her determination as a designer to take basic items of clothing and refine their silhouettes, eliminating surface distractions and cutting away at everything she judges to be extraneous to the function and purpose of the garment until finally what remains is deceptively simple and not infrequently a beautiful thing. With Balenciaga, she says, the more masterful you get, the lighter you can be the more you can take away and still have purity in the form. What's very interesting about this New York Times article, they draw this comparison with the artist, Canadian artist, by the way, Agnes Martin. They say, both have been pigeonholed as minimalist. Both share a preoccupation with clarity, simplified shapes, and what Martin has called light and lightness and breaking down form. Both are classicist in their orientation and perfectionist by disposition. Both are strong-willed and stubbornly self-made. And Jill Sander openly says she's been inspired by art, quote, I was always inspired by contemporary art and minimalist art, I always felt it was similar to what I was doing, that it helped me to keep my vision clear. When you see Ryman, you can easily say, oh, it's just a white canvas. And in the beginning, I tried to make people understand his work, but nobody understood, says Jill Sander, who began collecting works by Ryman, Twombly, and Ad Reinhardt and Mario Mertz with the first money she earned. I am glad that I'm a fashion designer because you can go directly to the human body to express yourself. I try to bring 
bring something to my work that you can also see in art. I am very well trained in my eye for proportion, but even with fashion, you have this other need to feel light and the quality of the craftsmanship of this thing on your body. Also, if it's not too pretentious, it gives you something to feed your soul. Jill Sanders, she did continue to pursue her designs. While her work was not booming in the 1980s, it was slowly building a following. She expanded into leather goods and eyewear collections in 1982. And then in 1989, Jill Sander publicly listed her brand on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. Then she started expanding her brand globally. And now let's talk about the 1990s. These were pretty much the golden years. The time was so ripe for her aesthetic. Her aesthetic in the 90s was definitely very sought after. She took this concept of masculine dressing, but there was still was this feminine appeal to it. There was still this like strong, like sensuality about her designs. And some of her most iconic looks, some of her most iconic collections came from this era. And I've done videos talking about this era. I've also done a video briefly talking about her in the 1980s. But yes, the time was ripe for her trademark, neutral colors, quality fabrics, and also her open-mindedness when it came to innovation and technology. In 1999, she actually used the Nike Air Max mesh for suiting. And so now let's talk about early 2000s period, which was a very difficult period for the brand. In 1999, the Prada Group bought a 75% share in the company with Sander still holding the role as creative designer and chairwoman. And the hope was that this business arrangement would expand and support a new accessories line. But only after six months, Jill Sander actually left the brand. I'm just gonna read this quote here from Grailed. It was an open secret that confrontations with Prada Group Chief Executive Patrizio Bertelli were what sent Sander off, their shared stubborn natures proving untenable. While the exact cause is hard to nail down, some speculate that it was Bertelli's unwillingness to bankroll Sander's well-known predisposition for expensive textiles and trims. I just want to point this out because I think if you're going to do a minimal brand, a brand that has a more minimal aesthetic, you cannot compromise on the quality of materials. And I talked about this in my video when I was talking about Jill Sander in the 80s, how there's just this intense love for the most high quality premium materials, but done in the most minimal way. For a lot of people that like sort of that luxury minimalist aesthetic, you just really can't cheapen the materials. You can't cheapen the production, the materials. Then what's the point? Like you might as well just go to Gap or something. And apparently after she left, almost all of her design and production team left right after. And in 2001, the Jill Sander Group reported a net loss of 4.9 million, its first ever. And a lot of people were actually very sad, very disappointed. Bertelli, the CEO of Prada, this is what he claimed. The individual fashion designer is less important than the company, following the brand's first show without Sander at the helm. Upon her exit, Sander went into retirement. During this time, Prada Group propped up Milan Vuk Merovic, a designer who worked at Gucci, and he was leading the design team, shifted the brand to create more commercial products. And then in 2003, it seemed like Bertelli and Jill Sander made amends. Jill Sander actually came back to show for spring, summer 2004. And she actually took a totally different approach. It was a little bit more on the feminine side. She used a little bit more color. And this was also in at the time in the early 2000s. There was just a little bit more excessive detailing here and there. Despite having some creative control, she did not stick with the brand. And then fall, winter 2005, she left. So now let's talk about the Raph Simmons era. So May 2005, Belgian menswear designer Raph Simmons joins Jill Sander to present his first collection, Fall Winter 2006. Some of the collections were very minimal, but some collections were very playful with form. But Raph Simmons always has this like very modernist touch to his designs. So even if he's going to get very experimental, use very bold, almost like graphic colors and very bold, strong defined forms, it actually really blended well with Jill Stander's modern minimal aesthetic. It was actually kind of an interesting era. When you look at some of the forms and the shapes, 
And while Raph Simmons was at Jill Sanders brand, the brand Jill Sanders, Jill Sander, the designer herself, actually teamed up with Uniqlo in 2009 to create the J Plus line. And this was to create clothing at an affordable price point. It's actually had a very beneficial partnership. Uniqlo successes in creating excessively priced clothing, very wearable clothing, and it actually did make sense. But this was only a brief collaboration and then it would come back again. And then Raph Simmons actually was going to leave Jill Sander to be at Dior. At this point, Jill Sander returned to the house. You would think like, why would she do this? Well, Prada Group had actually relinquished ownership. It had gone through a few changes. It was owned by Change Capital Partners, and then it was sold to Japan's Onward Holdings starting spring, summer 2013. She went back to the brand, but again, this was not something that lasted very long. From spring, summer 2013 menswear to spring, summer 2014 women's wear, it's a very brief period and her final period at the brand. And the brand also went through another sort of period where it was in flux again. So several seasons were handled by the Jill Sander team. Brand propped up Rodolfo Paglia Lunga, who was the creative director. He did depart fall, winter 2017. And then from 2017 today, the brand has been led by Luke and Lucy Meyer. So this is a husband and wife duo. And they actually have together a very interesting background. So Lucy Meyer has actually worked at Balenciaga when Nicholas Gasquet led the brand, when Raph Simmons was leading Dior, as well as when Marc Jacobs was at Louis Vuitton. Luke Meyer was actually a designer at Supreme and has also launched his own label all over Master Cloth, aka OAMC. Also worth noting, only the Brave in 2001 acquired 100% of this brand. Also owns Maison Margiela, Marnie, Diesel, and Victor and Rolf. And that's where we're at today. Honestly, there are some collections where I'm like, oh, I love it. Some other collections where, you know, it doesn't really like inspire me. But what I like about Jill Sander is they do have lines, like their core lines, which is like quality garments that you can wear on the regular. And I get this comment all the time when I talk about certain brands. Oh, you could just buy that from H&M or you can just buy like a fast fashion alternative. And yes, you can. You can definitely get lookalikes of almost every brand. Why you buy these brands is you buy them for the quality, obviously like the fit, the aesthetic, and you have like a personal affinity for this aesthetic, right? But I was recently looking at a pair of Jill Sander pants that I bought last year and I actually bought them very much in the sales. I think I got these for like 70% off and then an extra 20% off at Matches Fashion. I used to buy fast fashion. The last time I was buying fast fashion was when I was pregnant and I was buying maternity wear. Like I was just not going to buy myself like leggings and pants that were not going to last. But I remember when I was shopping for maternity wear at H&M, there was this collection, was so curious to try, called Juluva Heritage. So these are them, right? And I bought a few pieces from the collection. I think we all like know this, but if I'm just like looking at the construction of these pants, right? Like the construction of these pants, it is so cheap, it is so flimsy. Here, if I just show you, like to me, this is why I like to buy clothing, right? I think I probably paid like 180 for these and I probably paid 50 bucks for these pants, right? From H&M because this was a collaboration. And of course this is, you know, made in China, polyester. This is 100% cotton. This is made in Italy. When I just look at the construction, right? I was just looking at this today. I know maybe it's not something you can see on camera, but I just look at the, the pockets, right? Like look at all of these, like, like these, you know, this, this is why your pockets fall apart. Like all these strings falling off. It's not well designed. There's a lot of unfinished edges versus if I just show you this, right? The pockets are done properly. I'm sorry, I don't know the proper sewing terminology. I'm sure there are people that can explain this better than me, but when I just look at things like pockets, the interiors, how things are sewn, when I flip this up, like it's not falling apart. The edges are all finished and done beautifully. It's just a nicely designed garment. Everything is just done so beautifully. Whereas like this H&M piece of crap is like gonna fall apart. It's already falling apart. Like it's already, it's it's really garbage quality, right? And there's no shade to like anyone who's buying H&M. Obviously like I bought H&M, right? And sometimes just like the more practical thing to do. Like if you're gonna wear clothing for like less than three months or whatever, it makes sense. Like when I get these comments of like, oh, it's so not worth it to like, buy from a brand like Jill Sander. Again, I probably paid 180 bucks for this. 
versus I paid 50 bucks for this. This probably is gonna fall apart if I put like a wallet in this. Pockets are gonna fall apart. Fabric is just so cheap. While this is maybe just four times more the price point of this, again, I got it in the sale. To me, the quality is not even just like four times worth the price. To me, the quality of this is probably 20 times better. I'm not even kidding. But this is not also to say that buying from higher top tier brands, you're necessarily gonna get better. There are a lot of brands, and we know a lot of these brands have a, a lot of quality issues. And on the flip side, not everything from this line Oh my gosh, like strings like coming apart. Not everything from this line was like complete crap. There are gonna be instances where you're probably not gonna wear a piece of clothing for more than two months when you're pregnant or something. And then there are gonna be instances where you're gonna buy clothing that is going to last you a lifetime. I think like my concluding point is when I look at a brand like Jill Sander, it forces me to look at the quality and like just the interior construction. And I'm not trying to like say that buying from H&M is bad or whatever. And I'm not trying to say that buying from luxury goods is the way to go because obviously there are a lot of luxury brands that are overpriced and sell you really cheap garbage quality okay like I'm not here to like profess that if there's anything just like look at the interior of the garment look at the like little details that's kind of what I like about a lot of these minimalist brands it forces you to look at the details of the garment I'm definitely someone that loves to wear and wear my clothes that's why like a brand like Jill Sanders speaks to me I just really hope they continue making high quality garments that's probably what we'll leave this video on and I would love to know in the comments is this a brand you've purchased from I'd love to know and thank you so much for joining me in another one and I hope to see you in the next one bye